I hear there's rumors on the uh, internets. A mouse who finds himself drowning in a bucket of cream has two choices. Drown or fight so hard he churns that cream into butter. And simply climbs out. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Sunday Wire. I'm your host, Patrick Henningsen. We're streaming out live on the Alternate Current Radio Network and also 21stCenturyWire.com. A great live segment with our intrepid writer and correspondent, Andre Vilcek, uh, just before the break. If you missed any of that, if you're just joining us now midstream, you can catch that after the show up on 21 Wire and also on the podcasting platforms afterwards. Now, our roving correspondent for Culture and Sport is on the line, and he's going to be joining us right now from Valentine Towers down the south coast, the windy south coast of Britain, 90-mile-an-hour gale force winds we've got down here in the southwest, uh, Mr. Valentine. What have you got in terms of weather down there uh, in the Brighton area? Good evening, Patrick. Good to be with you. A uh, howling gale. I'm surprised listeners can't hear it in the background. We've had 50 mile an hour winds and feels like someone's chucking buckets of water at the windows. <laughs> right. Apocalyptic weather. Right. <laughs> Storm yeah. Dennis has unfortunately claimed a couple of lives. A man fell in a river in South Wales where, where uh, a state of emergency has been declared. There's tremendous flooding in Six or seven different parts of the country. Dennis the Menace, it's known as. Dennis yes. Menace. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty serious, actually. It's pretty serious. So, yeah, they've, they've stopped all the boats coming in and out of the harbor here. And uh, I don't think the ferry is going to be allowed in either. Not not today uh, because of the winds. But um, so it, there's other winds blowing, Basil. Uh, other winds blowing politically. There are indeed. Tell us about some of the other storms in particular. That well, the, the, story that, the story that won't go away and which unfortunately took a, a very sad turn this week is, of course, the ongoing witch hunt of Palestine activists and vocal supporters in the Labour Party, which last week appeared to claim its first fatality when a lady called Pauline Hamilton, a longtime activist from Hume in Manchester, who had been fast-track expelled from the party, that means there's no hearing, you're just automatically expelled, um, collapsed and died seven days after being expelled uh, for supposed anti-Semitism, but what was in reality simply her support for the Palestinian people, who are slowly being crushed. Um, now, there's no demonstrable causal link between her expulsion and her death seven days later. One has to say that, superficially at least, it would be coincidental. But uh, the two things of, to remember. First of all, uh, you know, a lot of people take their membership of the Labour Party extremely seriously. I was a member 30 years ago. Uh, I didn't care for all the rules and regulations and the, the you know the nature of campaigning and uh, well, the knocking door to door it wasn't for me really patrick so i was quite happy to let my membership lapse i've never rejoined since i've contemplated joining political parties over the last five or ten years but i've never done so but other people take their membership of their party particularly the labor party very very seriously so for somebody like pauline who is a you know, lifelong peace activist to be expelled for the Labour Party for anti-Semitism, which is a, a very serious, I must say, you know, a, a, you know, not something, not an epithet people want unless they've genuinely earned it or they're quite happy to be labelled as such for, a, for for hatred of Jewish people. So someone like this is very, very distressing uh, to be expelled from the party and therefore you shunned, no longer welcome at party events and all the rest of it, you know. So, you know, a lot of people's lives revolves around 
their membership of the Labour Party and their ability to go out and campaign in an organisation that has real potential for gaining political power and making change and all the rest of it. It's very much part, big part of their lives, not just MPs, but local party activists are the lifeblood of, of something like the Labour Party. So, although, as I say, one can say it's coincidental that this woman died simply a week after being expelled, um, you know, one can't help thinking that uh, she must have been extremely distressed. And uh, she was an older person. And, uh, you know, I, I know for a fact from personal experience from a friend of mine who... Uh, for whom circumstances unfortunately led to his premature death, in his case an aneurysm, uh, after uh, after somebody bounced a check on him and he was absolutely furious and had an aneurysm and which caused his immediate death. And, and this lady died of a hemorrhage um, because stress puts tremendous pressure on blood vessels that wouldn't otherwise necessarily be under pressure like that. And in older people that can... You know, that can cause strokes, heart attacks, aneurysms, all sorts of things. So it's really very sad and ridiculous. Uh, I read somewhere else that 25 people had been fast-tracked, expelled from the Labour Party in a single day recently. Uh, now, prior to this fast-tracking, of course, you know, there were hearings and people were given a chance to defend themselves. Um, but not anymore. You can apparently simply be, ex you can be expelled for uh, something as apparently innocuous, as Asa Wynn Stanley pointed out this week, as using the term Israel lobby or sharing one of, sharing articles from Electronic Intifada or, or Middle East Monitor or something. So the whole situation has taken a very, very dark turn since the general election and those who thought that uh, the witch hunt would slow up after Corbyn's defeat and his imminent resignation from the leadership were sadly much mistaken Patrick I, I just want to point out the danger you know what you're talking about this is actually expands into society this is an article that was in the telegraph a couple of I'll read the headline a couple of days ago. Police report 120,000 cases of non-crime, quote, hate incidents have been left on the police record. So police have recorded nearly 120,000 non-hate or sorry, non-crime hate incidents. OK, that's basically where someone reports a hate crime, but it turns out not to be a crime, but it stays on your record. OK, so these are hate incidents which may have uh, prevented the accused from getting jobs, according to disclosure from the police. So despite police uh, accepting that such incidents were not crimes, they still logged them onto the system and they can still show up during a criminal records check when applying for work. So the figures revealed that uh, in this case, uh, this was a Humberside police case who investigated this person over an alleged, listen to this, transphobic tweets. Turns out wasn't a crime, wasn't even a hate crime, none, none of this. This is, a, this is a real problem. This is the result of this witch hunt, politically correct, uh, this enforcement culture, canceling culture that you're, you're, just, you're, sh you're showing one example, Basil, within one political party, but this problem extends even outside of that, f into society. Isn't that incredible? Yes, very much so. We're seeing the corridor of acceptable opinion being increasingly narrowed. Now, theoretically, of course, in the Labour Party, it is still possible to advocate for the Palestinian people, but not, it seems, if that advocacy seem, includes any criticism of Israel. Well, it's for, or even statement of of historical facts relating to the Nakba, the 1967 war, uh, you know, describing the settlements as illegal, using the word apartheid to describe Israel. All these things are falling into the so-called anti-Semitism trap, even if 
simply factually correct, you know. So, quite again, again, what's going to happen at uh, conference this year? I have no idea. But as I've said before, the Labour Party's got four hundred thousand members, and I would imagine probably three hundred and ninety thousand of them have some criticism of Israel, but not necessarily, it seems. The uh, the leadership candidates who at a hustings organised jointly this week by Jewish Labour Movement and Labour Friends of Israel were falling over themselves to say uh, how much they supported Israel, and we didn't have a single word of of dissent from the lockstep, you know, one hundred percent pro Zionist line. Even though that that at the moment and for the last twenty years has meant allying yourself with the with the hard right they could. It's not as if there was a major peace party in Israel, who genuine peace party, left of centre, who were, you know, on the threshold of power or something. The choice of, in Israeli politics that voters will be making in a couple of weeks' time in the third general election in a year will be between the hard right and the very hard right, in the shape of Gantz and, and, uh, and Bibi, of course. Um, but describing Israel as in any way racist is, uh, that's a no-go. That's automatic, that's fast-track expulsion. If you say Israel's racist and you're a Labour Party member, you're kicked out immediately. Even though, as we know, the nation-state laws are just some of about 130 different ways in which Palestinians are discriminated against by the Israeli legal system, by its constitution. It's never a constitution, that's basic laws, but you know, there are dozens of ways in which Palestinians are discriminated against simply for being Palestinians. But you're not allowed to say that's racist or you'll be kicked out of the Labour Party. So so calling out racism is racist, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's the that's 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 exactly right. And racists are allowed to kick anti racists out of the party for pointing out racism. Chew <laughs> get your head around that for a minute. Get your head around that. Did you see that BBC had a little uh, sort of television hustings with all the candidates for the Labour Party leadership competition, which is going to be this long, painful three-month process that we're going to all be subject to? But did, did you see this? I've, I've got this clip, actually. Did you happen to catch this? Uh, y- yes, I, I'm, I'm aware of it and what they said. If you've got the clip queued up, Patrick, please feel free to play it. Yeah, yeah I'm going to roll this. And it's basically they're falling over themselves. They're asked, what is the number one priority for you as labor leader? And, of course, there's a lot of problems in the country, right? You've got homelessness. uh, You've got people dying because they can't afford to heat their homes, uh, gouging by by the power companies and so forth. You've got austerity ravaging through various uh, institutions throughout the country, education crisis. You've got all these things. But that's not what they were talk. That's not the answer that they gave when they were asked this pointed question. Let's play this. Rebecca Long Bailey. I've got a few number one priorities. Just I think one. tackling anti-Semitism within the party is one. Oh my gosh! So there's that's Rebecca Long Bailey. That was the first one. And she's supposed to be she's supposed to be the continuity candidate from Corbyn. She's the left wing candidate. <laughs> really, really. Yeah, I mean, she's an intellectual pygmy um, of the first order. What you know, what this does is indicate the way all the all the uh, candidates, including the left candidate, have bought into this narrative that there's somehow an anti-Semitism crisis in the party. And of course, the problem then is that as soon as anybody else, other voices start to say, like Chris Williamson, hold on a moment, I'm not sure that there is, then you're part of the problem. It's the classic way which it's the classic way which hunt works. You see, and the fact that. See, the, the people could now point to the fact that, oh, 25 people expelled in one day, fast-track expelled for anti-Semitism. Indica- that's proof that there's an anti-Semitism crisis in the Labour Party. Well, and until you look at the offences for which they've been expelled, which are simple Palestine advocacy. So the, the c- deliberate conflation of the two, Palestine advocacy and anti-Semitism, has unfortunately now runs through the Labour Party like like mold running through a Stilton, you know, 
it's like the uh, the dictator uh, autocracy dictatorship say saying we've got we've got this crime problem and we we can prove it because we just arrested a hundred people this weekend for very whatever the crime is so there's an absolute uh, pandemic of this crime in the country we we proved it because we arrested ten people or we sentenced ten people is completely Kafkaesque. Yes, exactly. It, you know, it's, it's rounding up uh, dissidents and suspects, effectively, isn't it? You know, to prove there's a problem of, of yeah. insurrection. So uh, I'll play well, we, it's, it's Stalinesque. We rounded up two hundred dissidents. Who, they were plotting. Do you know what I mean? So here's the rest of them. Listen to this. And the second priority is developing a policy program that's transformational, building on the green industrial revolution, dem- democratizing um, our communities and our party. Emily Thornbury, number one priority. Number one priority as leader of the Labour Party in opposition is to make sure that we are united, that we're on the front foot and that we're fighting back. And as if you were to become leader and win the next election as prime minister, number one priority? Number one priority has to be to rebalance our economy, to have an active industrial strategy that brings jobs back to the regions and that links in with a green industrial strategy. Lisa Nandy, number one priority. As the leader of the Labour Party, my number one priority would be to deal with anti-Semitism because we don't have any moral authority to go out and fight for a better country until we've done it. But as a prime minister... Oh my gosh. I can't believe I just heard that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, I don't think she's going to win, but you know, yeah, it's absolutely that, that 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 it has made it to the number one priority for the Labour leader is is absolutely extraordinary. You know, yeah, Mister, my absolute first priority will be to get investment back into areas that have seen forty years of economic decline. Why? Because those young people in towns like mine have no choice but to leave in order to find work and opportunities. It breaks families apart and it's causing major problems in our big cities with high housing prices and overcrowding, congestion, air pollution and strain on public services. We have got to do better as a country than this. But before we do all that, we have to tackle anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Of course. Makes perfect sense. Well, what it is effectively is a purge of not only of Palestine advocates, but of the left. Yeah. Um, you know, the Labour Party, a lot of people joined as a result of Corbyn and, uh, you know, the rejection of neoliberalism. So in addition to being uh, obviously a decidedly anti-free speech move, and we're not talking here about genuine anti-Semitism, about people who, who hate all Jewish people and ex- being Jews and, and, and express that. Uh, we're talking about this only anti-Semitism. It also targets left-wingers and uh, those who reject the neoliberal consensus because the the subtext to this is to uh, bring the party firmly back in a Blairite direction and and kill off the aspirations of of, uh, thousands of working people. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll listen to the rest of them here. Yes. Number one priority, Sir Keir Starmer. I agree with Lisa on anti-Semitism. I think until we can demonstrate that uh, anybody who's anti-Semitic is out of our party, uh, we will not be able to persuade people that uh, we can win an election. So that has to be a priority about the tolerant, respectful sort of party that we are. We then do need to unite. We've been arguing and dividing. Wait a minute. So so he wants to purge 300,000 or whatever members of, of the Labour Party? Is that is that what he's saying? Well, this is it. This is- this is it. None of those three have defined anti-Semitism. Uh, but, of course, the Labour Party adopted the H- IHRA definition uh, with all its examples. That's part of the 10 pledges that uh, the Board of Deputies uh, ultimatum that they all signed up to at the beginning of their cam- campaign. So they're all saying a, be a purge of anti-Semitism. But if you use the IHRA definition, and that means no criticism of Israel. It's as simple as that. Incredible. Yeah. Divided, and there's an old saying that divided parties don't win elections. It's an old saying because it's true. So we've got to pull together, um, and then we've got to have a way of winning that general election that is serious about changing our economy um, and serious about climate. Because our, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And our economy just isn't working. When an eight-year-old has to wait 18 months to get a mental health assessment, something is seriously wrong with our country. 
What is an what is an eight year old's mental health assessment have to do with the climate? I couldn't work out how he he managed to <laughs> bridge those two together. And sadly, he is the favourite. He is the man most likely to be the next leader of the Labour Party, wow. Sir Keir Starmer. That's what we've got, you know. Yeah, he is. Um, right. He is absolutely he's high energy, as they would say. He reminds me of Jeb Bush. High energy. That's where we are now. The other thing, of course, that uh, the other latest row uh, amongst the leadership candidates uh, is over another set of ultimatums, this time delivered by transsexual groups, um, calling on them to denounce organizations uh, like Women's Place and these feminist groups. And this is this is turning into a... Uh, uh, another big hoo-ha, for want of a better expression, with these uh, women's groups, of course, being denounced as transphobic because they uh, seek to, I, uh, well, seek to identify self-identifying men as not being women and therefore allowed access to women's only spaces. That's considered transphobic. But personally, Patrick, I think you know. If you or I were to get up tomorrow morning, declare that we were a woman, and uh, that we then we then demanded access just simply by self-identification, while we retain all our uh, productive reproductive organs, but because we declare ourselves women, this means that we should be given access to uh, women-only spaces. It's the idea is absolutely absurd. Um, but if I could. Uh, just dip in. Um, the candidates who signed the pledge, uh, which includes calling several organizations trans exclusionists hate groups, are now facing demands to produce evidence for that allegation. A row over a pledge card drawn up by the Labour Campaign for Trans Rights Group broke out last week after Rebecca Long Bailey, who you heard from there at the beginning of that clip, Lisa Nandy, the other woman for whom tackling anti-Semitism in the party is apparently the number one priority. As well as deputy leadership candidates Angela Rayner and Dawn Butler, they all expressed support for the Charter. And the Charter calls on Labour to expel, once again, it's all about expulsions, Patrick, it's all about purges, you know, of uh, people with different opinions. It calls on Labour to expel transphobic members and describes campaigns including Women's Place UK as trans-exclusionist hate groups. <laughs> and again, isn't it interesting that the interjection, the injection, I should say, of the word hate. Now, I, there's no evidence that Women's Place UK hate people. Uh, simply because they wish to protect women-only spaces, you know. You see what I mean? <laughs> so, it, it's, it, it has its parallel in the anti-Semitism thing. Uh, you know, people do not hate Jews or Israelis simply because they criticize the policies of the state of Israel or speak up for Palestinian people. The, the hate is being in injected by those claiming to be victims. Right. So, so yeah, exactly. What just I'll quickly say work, you know, if you're opposing war crimes or if you're uh, supporting the human rights of somebody who's being oppressed, that how that can be transformed into hate speech is a, is quite a gymnastics move, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. But that's, that's kind of where we are now on sadly on it what what appears to be an increasing number of issues where plurality of opinion is no longer tolerated so women's place uk have now written to the leadership figures demanding to see the evidence behind the claim that they're hate groups the group has also written to the candidates who have not signed the pledge asking to meet them to discuss this growing row so far none of the candidates have replied unsurprisingly the Labour campaign for trans rights pledge states that the party has failed to act as transphobia has gained ground within the party. So that this is interesting. Apparently, transphobia has gained ground. That what you know what evidence for this is absolutely no idea. It said last week it was heartened by the solidarity of the Labour candidates and reiterated its view that Women's Place UK perpetuated discrimination against trans people. 
Women's Place UK is pushing for ministers to consult more widely about changes to the Gender Recognition Act, which would allow people to legally self-identify as a man or woman without medical approval, which is the example I just gave, Patrick, that without any, uh, with, without a trip to a doctor to uh, even ascertain the uh, mental state or health, let alone the physicality, appearance or anything else of the individual, uh, or, you, you know, people would be able to legally self-identify. So therefore you would be able to legally say, Patrick, that you are a woman and therefore you demand access to women-only spaces, even if you haven't taken any hormones or undergone any kind of uh, gender reassignment surgery, you'd simply get up tomorrow, declare that you're a woman, it would be have the full force of the law, and you could demand access to all women's spaces. Now, apparently opposing that is hateful and transphobic. Right, so I could I could get a membership to the uh, local gym, Virgin Athletic, or whatever it's called, and uh, just uh, mosey on into the women's uh, locker rooms. And um, if if there's any pushback on that, I could uh, I could claim that I'm a victim of um, of hate speech or uh, I'm a hate. That's right, I'm a hate. discrimination. Yeah, so you just walk in there with hate my hate and discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Just stroll in, stroll into the women's room uh, with a cigar in hand and whatnot, and uh, say, I feel like I'm a woman today. Is this this is the world that they want to build? Is this is this the reality that they want to foist upon? Western society, what an unholy joke this is! It's just ridiculous. So, 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 Basil, this, this is absolutely as you, we discussed this before the show. You're saying that politics is no longer a forum for debate, uh, and these special interest groups—they're just um, issuing ultimatums. I mean, this is—is is, I don't know, explain that that concept to us. Yeah, well, it, it's um, the, both the Board of Deputies with the 10 pledges, it demanded that the Labour Party leadership candidates sign or be forever labelled uh, an anti-Semite, even though the 10 pledges have written really nothing to do with hatred of Jews per se, and we're all about taking over the uh, disciplinary process of the Labour Party so that they could get on with these fast-track expulsions and all the rest of it. But yet, yeah, 10 pledges, effectively an ultimatum, 10 demands, or you will be labelled a hater. And now we've had it from this trans rights group. Sign our pledges or you will be labelled a hater. Now, you know, <laughs> is this the way politics is, uh, is supposed to operate now? Is there not any attempt to discuss things in a sensible, rational, and open way, whereby people can, uh, you know, express themselves fully and the, you know, issues, ideas, etc., surrounding uh, what are admittedly difficult subjects without being, uh, you know, immediately labelled and, and shut down. This is, this is very damaging for society as a whole, Patrick. That um, that we seem to be losing the ability to uh, to tolerate the views of others, and also drifting away from you know evidence based uh, reasoning, which is the legacy of the Enlightenment. You know, yes. Whether it's the whether it's the the trans thing or the uh, so called anti semitism crisis in the Labour Party, which for which. You know, if we go back a couple of years, there is scant evidence, you know, of genuine anti-Semitism. Scant, if any, evidence, a tiny amount. In fact, less than amongst the general population. Exactly. Yet, because the narrative has been established in a particular way, uh, the fulcrum of of what was debate becomes moved so far in one direction that there ceases to be any kind of intelligent, rational conversation at all. And there, in, instead we find ourselves in a sort of Stalinist situation where critique of the critique is an offence, you know. And, and and that's the case too with this transphobia business. And it's it's become absolutely ridiculous is the only way. It would be ridiculous if it wasn't so sinister. Yeah, because because uh, so this is where censorship, uh, as you were saying earlier, you know, the, the, all this censorship, this is actually promoting 
it's 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 killing uh, democracy. Actually, it has the potential to really undermine in a sinister way the, the, this culture of uh, censorship, enforcing it. It, it. This is actually undemocratic, isn't it? Do you think? Absolutely, one hundred percent undemocratic. You know, one hundred percent uncivilized. You know. Um, but we've got this, it's, you know, it's identity politics that has brought this about to some extent. And the whole thing about the Labour Party, the Labour movement in general, was that supposedly uh, you know, it didn't matter what race, colour, creed, sexual preference or orientation you were. Uh, the Labour Party was united around uh, the cause of universal human rights, social justice, etc., you know. But that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. It seems that particular minorities who sort of consider themselves to be historic and long-standing and semi-permanent victims have the right to put a gun to the head of anybody they choose and say that unless you accept our victimhood on our terms and all that goes with it, we're going to pull the trigger. And pulling the trigger means that you are excluded from, from the forum permanently. So the last thing I want to add about that is that this has caused considerable distress. It's indicative of uh, of the sort of particularly harsh way uh, people are treated these days. Uh, only yesterday, this uh, television presenter, Caroline Flack, committed suicide because she was due to go to court over an assault on her, her boyfriend, even though he didn't want the police to press charges. They did so. And uh, she's a very successful TV personality. I must admit, I didn't know much about her. But she committed suicide, sadly, uh, yesterday as a result of the sort of societal pressure on the position in which she found herself. And, you know, we seem to be moving towards a society where uh, emotional support for people is in very short supply if they're in tricky situations. Just to bring it back to the... So the Labour Party anti-Semitism crisis, I've also read online about one or two people who've been expelled for uh, so-called anti-Semitism be feeling suicidal because, as I say, it's a very you know, bad smear on their name, you know. Oh, are you still a member of the Labour Party? No, I was expelled for being an anti-Semite. Oh, wow, oh, blimey. Wow, you're one of them, are you? you know, so it's not something that people who take their politics seriously, particularly peace and anti-racist campaigners, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a black mark, which is totally unjustified and terribly unwelcome. But unfortunately, it, you know, it's the direction of travel at the moment, Patrick. I say absolutely incredible. It's almost unbelievable that this is uh, this is happening. So I don't know where where, where we see this going. It's going to hit the wall of reality at some point. I mean, of course, the end result is it's calling the opposition to uh, the ruling party. Clearly, so this is, if anything, it's going to guarantee uh, that the ruling party is going to stay in power for much longer than they might normally be because there's no there's going to be no viable opposition. I personally think that that's by design. Uh, if you look at the media. And the groups who have uh, engineered this uh, fake crisis over the last couple of years, I think this is all by design. Uh, so it's you, you only have to, as Voltaire said, if you want to see who rules over you, uh, you only have to see who you're not allowed to criticize. So, uh, but but that that's not good for democracy. If you don't have a viable opposition, that means you could have an authoritarian power structure that's being built at that time. Well, I mean- we do in many ways, Patrick, in, in, in the ruling party, but also it means opposition to the governing ideology is being purged, such that even the so-called opposition party, if led by the likes of Keir Starmer, nevertheless still represents the same basic ideology as the party in power, you know. Correct, correct. That's so the, that, yes. That, that's why there's no democracy. Now, in Ireland, of course, with proportional representation, they've just uh, elected... Uh, Sinn Féin is the largest party, and they do represent a break from the neoliberal consensus yes. in uh, in Ireland. Um, 
if there, we had proportional representation in the UK, then we would have a very different political map, indeed. So to you know, explain to people what Sinn Féin is, uh, Basil. I mean, that's a shocker because they broke a two-party du- duopoly. It's really a two-party stronghold for, what, 30 years in Ireland? They just for longer, 60 or 70 years, really, I mean, since the... Uh, so explain to people who Sinn Féin is in America who, who might not know. Sinn Féin was uh, the political wing of the Irish Republican Army which uh, has long since sought a united Ireland uh, and rejects the division of Ireland into the still British controlled and owned and operated North, which still has a small majority of loyalists, Protestant supporters of uh, remaining in the United Kingdom. Um, And uh, um, the minority Irish nationalist Catholic population who they represent and uh, they came to prominence in the 1970s and 80s primarily in Northern Ireland itself with the election of MPs like uh, Gerry Adams Martin McGuinness who never took up their seats in Westminster because they entirely rejected Westminster's authority over the North but who have since come to play a prominent role in Northern Ireland politics in the devolved government in the storm in the Stormont, and ironically, Martin McGuinness and the staunch unionist, the Reverend Dr. Ian Paisley of the Democratic Unionist Party, worked together very successfully in the devolved Parliament, the Stormont, and uh, could frequently be seen uh, at uh, the uh, assembly meetings where they sat next to each other. Paisley was number one and McGuinness was number two uh, in a power sharing agreement. They could frequently be seen uh, talking animatedly and joking with each other in a very friendly way, such that they became known as the Chuckle Brothers, which 20 or 30 years previously, when when the paramilitary organizations of both sides were shooting and killing each other, with gay abandon, uh, would have seemed absolutely impossible. Uh, More recent years have seen seen Sinn Féin, which is an avowedly uh, left-wing party, uh, very pro-Palestinian and, you know, very much uh, rejecting the the, uh, neoliberal or imperialist consensus, as I say, because it supports the minority in uh, Northern Ireland and wishes to see a united Ireland. They've gradually grown in popularity in the South as people have become increasingly dissatisfied with the Fianna Gael and Fianna Foyle, the, you know, the two so-called centrist parties that have in fact moved Ireland inevitably further and further to the right. So, but in, in Ireland, they have a strict proportional representation. You get 20% of the votes, you get 20% of the seats, um, which means that, uh, Therefore, the makeup of the Doyle, the Irish Parliament, is a much more direct reflection of the will of the people than we have here in Britain, where 43% of people voted Conservative, yet they have 60% of the seats, which must sound to some listeners really quite bizarre. And do you think they're going to be able to form a government, uh, Sinn Féin? I mean, uh, still going to be a challenge, isn't it? Because, well, the two two stronghold main parties, they're not going to say give up so easily but you do have the other other parties like the green party picked up a, a quite a few extra seats they could be a potential partner there what, what do you think do you think they'll be able to lead i think i i haven't been studying it this weekend but it uh looks like the horse let's put it this way i think the horse trading is going to continue for some time but uh i would imagine Sinn Féin will at least be able to claim the scalp of the current Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, who, who seems increasingly unpopular uh, and people don't like the direction he's been taking Ireland at all. Yeah, he took a bath on his uh, in his local constituency as well, I think. He didn't do, do terribly well. So, uh, yeah, the first time ever in history. So not, not too popular. Yeah, Ireland's going through a, a major transition period. A little bit of a backlash uh, from how things have been going in recent years. So we'll see. But uh, United Ireland uh, seems to be on the cards. I'm hearing more and more positive talk in that direction, Basil. And uh, certainly demographics uh, favor that potentially in the north. Maybe not well, now. But Sinn Féin want a referendum on it at some point over the next five years. You know, so... 
Wow. Imagine, imagine that. So Scotland bolts, our Northern Ireland goes, and then it's, then what happened to the United Kingdom? Is it, it's, is it little England at that point? Yeah. Well, good point. You know, um, one of the, one or two of the labor leadership campaigners, uh, leaders have said that they, uh, they don't feel they can deny um, the Scots another referendum if they want one. No. So, so yeah, I, 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 that's correct. That's so correct. the possibility, at least, of of an independent Scotland, which would then I would imagine have a another referendum quite quickly afterwards about rejoining the European Union, is is on the cards. You know, but. And Northern Ireland would go into the EU as well, if probably, most likely, right? If they if they united with uh, the South, right? Oh, if they united with the South, they would. Yes, yes. So, so, so it might be just England and Wales out of the EU, but we're speculating now, Patrick. Yeah. So, but theoretically, Great Britain it goes Brexit, leaves the EU, Great Britain, but then then Great Britain becomes just Little Britain, and uh, half of it, or not half of it, but close a third of it, let's say. Uh, rejoins the the European Union uh, under a different uh, guise, so that's an interesting outcome, isn't it? Uh, we, we, yeah, if we get there, yes, it's, uh, it's certainly one possible scenario. Yeah, but a long, lot of water to flow under the bridge before then. Yep. Well, we're going to wrap it up, Basil. So, anything else before we go? Well, only uh, the uh, American scene, of course. Super Tuesday, March the third is the day that will almost certainly determine who the who the who the candidate is Texas uh, Colorado big states voting on uh, on March the 3rd and uh, the latest candidate of course to be promoted by the uh, democrat establishment as well as Peter Buttigieg is uh, the charming Amy Klobuchar Oh, and we should say, too, that it's come out this week that Bloomberg uh, is rising in the polls and uh, wants Hillary Clinton as his running mate. Oh, God. Wow. Now, a more, uh, you know, a more sort of elitist, plutocratic, oligarch ticket it was impossible to imagine than Bloomberg Clinton, you know. I think that will guarantee a Trump re-election. Absolutely. A 100% certainty. A lock. Because if, if, if Bloomberg, who's bought his way into the party, he's bought everything, every bit of support he has purchased, okay? That's documented. That's do- including governors. He's paying people to big him up on Instagram and, you know, all sorts of things, you know. He, he's, he's go- governors, states' governors' endorsements he has purchased by backing their campaigns over the years. There's, at least, right. there's at least 10 people in Congress that he's paid for them to be in office, okay? This is a proper oligarch. They talk about Russian oligarchs buying their way into power. They have nothing on this guy. This is a proper oligarch purchasing power directly. And if he has Hillary as his vice president, man, none of the Bernie Sanders support, which is a a, a significant block of votes, is not going to vote for for that ticket. I tell Come November, they'll either sit no, it out. I mean, that's the ticket. Sanders would come under pressure to run as a third party candidate. Absolutely. I mean, there would be some sort of left wing populist insurgency of some description because it would be so up unrepresentative of uh, uh, of the will of the people. You know, it's Trump. That's it's just handing Trump a victory. So you know, they'll, they'll make their bed uh, as they as they did last time. They're going to have to lie in it, basically, Basil. Um, but we'll, we'll go into Bloomberg more uh, maybe in the coming weeks. Uh, I have quite a lot of material on him. It's it's pretty shocking, actually. This guy is unbelievable. He makes Trump look like a, a street hustler, you know, in comparison. Yeah, I mean, he's much, much wealthier than Trump. Yeah, and just he, he the level of, of – he's got – all the big data, Cambridge Analytica firms working for him. He spent, you know how much money he spent already? No, please tell me. You don't want to know. You don't want to know. We're not, even, we're not even into the primaries. He has burned $400 million or something like this so far. $400 million, yeah. Hillary's campaign broke all records for a presidential campaign. Her losing campaign in 2016, uh, she burned through about $900 million by the end of it. Okay, nobody knows where that money went. God knows. Yeah. 
God only knows. But Bloomberg's already done almost half of that, and they're not even halfway through the primaries yet. So he, by the end of this, if, if he gets the nomination, theoretically, he would have, by the end, spent in excess over a billion dollars on the campaign. All self-funded. He's not getting any money from PACs. Of course, well, I was going to say also uh, individual donations. I mean, I wonder if there is actually anybody out there who thought to themselves, hey, Mike, I, I really like what you've got to say and what you're offering the American people. I hear you're short of a few dimes. Uh, I'm going to send you a check or... Do you take PayPal for my twenty dollars? You know, I know it's like if Bill Gates slipped and like broke his leg, and you know, you, you open a GoFundMe account for Bill. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's but it's that ridiculous, isn't it? Um. <laughs> so, but he he will be asking for other people's money after the uh, after if he steals the nomination from from Sanders, no doubt, and uh, the money will come pouring in. At the moment, they're they're backing all all of the backing for Buttigieg and Liz Warren and Biden is only for people to harvest and Klobuchar, uh, who's the most annoying of all. But this is only to harvest delegates uh, so that they can use that as leverage to do, to do a coup on the floor at the DNC uh, convention in July. That's, 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 Liz Warren will hobble along at 13 15% or whatever because they know that if she drops out, all of those votes are going to Bernie and the others can kiss their asses goodbye. So, so she'll hobble along just to keep Bernie Sanders from getting a few more delegates, and then they'll they'll pull the rug out from under the old todger in July, and they will reap the whirlwind of that. By the way, uh, th- they'll regret that because that's going to guarantee Trump a re-election, basically. And in, in anyway, the, the the aim is to deny Sanders a a majority of delegates on the floor, one way or another. If they can keep him down to 30%, 30-something percent, even, you know, up to sort of mid-40s percent of the total number of delegates, then the horse trading will kick in and, uh, the, you know, they'll, they'll come up with a, a so-called unity candidate. Just to give uh, listeners an idea of the rapidly shifting sands with the uh, Democrat nomination. Bernie is still the favorite with the bookmakers at a best price 13 to 8. Um, I love the fractional odds, but uh, other people find them rather confusing. That means proportionally, of course, if you stake $8 on Bernie winning uh, and he gets the nomination, you win another 13. Mm-hmm. So he's slightly, you know, he's slightly odds against. It works out as about uh, 1.4 times your stake plus your stake back. But nevertheless, he's the favorite at 13 to 8. Next in the betting now is our friend Mike. He's 2 to 1, second favorite, clear second favorite. In fact, the bookies have it basically between Bernie and Mike. Uh, with Biden now out to 10 to 1. Wow. I, I I wouldn't back Biden at fifty to one, frankly. Pete Buttigieg, also a ten to one shot with Pat Brooks, the magic sign. Hillary Clinton, twenty two to one as the brokered convention candidate. Mm-hmm. Amy Klobuchar, twenty five to one. Neil deGrasse Tyson, forty five to one. I didn't even know he was running. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren is 70 to 1. Now she was the 11 to 4 favorite a few weeks ago. Hold on. So you're telling me Neil deGrasse Tyson gets you better odds than Elizabeth Warren? Are you serious? Well, well I mean, what was he more fancied in the betting? Wow. He's, he has, he's considered to have a better chance of becoming oh, that's not good nominee. Campaign. That's bad. Wow. Warren 70 to 1. 125 to 1 Michelle Obama. Of course, we're now in the sort of fantasy brokered convention candidates, you know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, something like, you know, do you think Hillary would go under Obama, under Michelle and on an all-women ticket, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that's... No, I know. They, they, they don't it's get... It's not happening, is it? <laughs> it's not going to happen. I, I think so. there's reasons why the Obamas have had to sit out on this one. Um, I think there's there's been some, you know, threats made. So uh, we'll see. 
um, anyway. So that's where we are. Sanders and Bloomberg, the two clear front runners now. Okay. Well, there'll be something uh, to keep an eye on. Of course, Super Tuesday is coming up on March 3rd. That's not long from now. The next primary, I believe, is Nevada, which is the caucuses as well. So there'll be some shenanigans and funny business there. But uh, they're not using a digital app, thank God. So they're scrambling to find out how to count votes by hand, that old skill that everyone seems to have quickly forgotten how to do. So- 